chapter 8. Click on, it sat quietly on a long stone bench in one of the upper levels of the lavishly beautiful Mead Gardens in the dwarf community known as Colhaven. He had a perfect view of the amazing gardens, stretching down the rocky hillside in systematic levels that tapered off about the edges and carefully laid pieces of cut stone, reminiscent of a long waterfall flowing down a gentle slope. The creation of the gardens on this once barren hillside was a truly marvellous accomplishment. Special soils had been hauled from a more fertile region to be placed on the garden site, enabling thousands of beautiful flowers and plants to flourish year-round in the mild climate of their lower now. The colour was indescribable. To compare the myriad hues of the flowers to the colours of the rainbow would have been a great injustice. Flick attempted briefly to count the various shades, a task he soon found to be impossible. He gave up quickly and turned his attention to the large clearing at the foot of the gardens, where members of the dwarf community were passing on their way to or from whatever work they were engaged in. They were a curious people, it seemed to Flick, but dedicated to hard work and a well-guarded order of life. Everything they did was always carefully planned in advance, meticulously thought out to a point where even the cautious flick was nettled by the time spent in preparation. But the people were friendly and eager to be of service, a kindness not lost on either of the visiting veilmen, who felt more than a bit out of place in this strange land. They had been in Colhaven for two days now, and still... They had not been able to learn what had happened to them, why they were there, or how long their stage would be. Balanor told them nothing, advising them that he knew very little himself, and that all would be revealed in due time. A comment Flick found to be not only melodramatic, but aggravating. There was no sign of Balanor, no word of his whereabouts. Worst of all, there was no news of the absent minion. And the brothers had been forbidden to leave the safety of the dwarf village for any reason. Flick glanced to the floor of the gardens again to see if his personal bodyguard was still there and quickly spied him off to one side, his tireless gaze fixed on the veilman. She had been infuriated by this treatment, but Bellinor was quick to point out that someone should be with them at all times in case of an attempt on their lives by one of the roving Northland creatures. Flick had acquired readily, remembering all too well the close call he had already had with the skull bearers. He put aside his old, idle thoughts at the approach of Shear on the winding garden path. Anything? Flick danced anxiously as the other reached his side and sat down quietly next to him. Not a word, came the short reply. She felt vaguely exhausted all over again, even though he had two days to recover from the strange odyssey that had brought them from their home in Shady Vale to the forests of the Anar. Their treatment had been decent, if sometimes a bit overdone, and the people seemed genuinely concerned for their welfare. But there had been no word given out as to what was to happen next. Everyone, including Balinor, seemed to be waiting for something Perhaps the arrival of the long absent Alanon. Balanor had been unable to explain to them how they had reached the Anar. Responding to a mysterious flashing light, he had found them lying on a low river bank just outside of Colhaven two days ago, and had brought them to the village. He knew nothing of the old man, nor of how they had travelled that long distance upstream. When she had mentioned the legends concerning a killing of the Silver River, Balanor shrugged and nonchalantly agreed that anything was possible. No news of Minion? Flick asked instantly. Only that the dwarves are still out looking for him, and it may take some time, she answered quietly. I don't know what to do next. Flick inwardly conceded that this last admission had proved to be the story of the entire outing. He glanced downward to the foot of the meat gardens where a small cluster of heavily armed dwarves were con congregating around the commanding figure of Balinor, who 
who had suddenly appeared from the woods beyond. Even from their vantage point atop the gardens, the Valmen could tell that he still wore the chain mail beneath the long hunting cloak that had come to recognise so well. He spoke earnestly with the dwarf for a few minutes, his face lined in thought. Sheer and Fleck knew very little about the Prince of Callahorn, but the people of Culhaven seemed to have the highest regard for him. Minion, too, had spoken well of Balinor. His homeland was the northernmost kingdom of the sprawling Southland, commonly referred to as the Borderlands. It served as a buffer zone fronting the southern boundaries of the Northland. The citizens of Calahorn were predominantly men, but unlike the majority of the people of their race, they mingled freely with the other races and did not pursue a policy of isolation, isolationism. The highly regarded Border Legion was quartered in that distant country. A professional army commanded by Rul Bakana, King of Calahorn, and the father of Balamor. Historically, the entire Southland had relied on Calahorn and the Legion to blunt the initial thrust of an invading army, giving the rest of the land a chance to prepare for battle. In the 500 years since its formation, the Border Legion had never been defeated. Illinois had begun a slow ascent to the stone bench, where the Valmen sat patiently waiting. He smiled a greeting as he came up to them, aware of the discomfort they felt and not knowing what was to happen to them and of the anxiety they were experiencing for the safety of their missing friend. He sat down next to them and was silent for a few minutes before speaking. I know how difficult this must be for you, he began patiently. I have every available dwarf warrior out looking for your lost friend. If anyone can find him in this region, they can. And they won't give up, I promise you. The brothers nodded their understanding of Balinor's efforts to help them in any way possible. This is a very dangerous time for these people, though. I suppose Elanon did not speak of it. They are facing the threat of an invasion through the upper and R by gnomes. There have already been skirmishes all along the border, and signs of a huge army massing somewhere above the Strelheim plains. You may have guessed that all of this is tied in with the Warlock Law. Does this mean that the Southland is in danger too? asked an anxious flick. Undoubtedly, Balinor nodded. That's one reason why I'm here. To arrange a coordinated defensive strategy with the Dwarf Nation, in case of an all-out assault. But where is Elanon then? asked Shea quickly. Is he going to get here soon enough to help us? What has the sort of scenario got to do with all this? Balinor looked at the puzzled faces and shook his head slowly. I must honestly confess that I cannot give you the answers to any of those questions. Elanon is a very mysterious figure, but a wise man who has been a dependable ally whenever we had needed him in the past. When I saw him last, several weeks before, I spoke to you in Shady Bell. We set a date to meet in the Anar. He is already three days overdue. He paused in quiet speculation, looking down at the gardens and beyond, to the great trees of the Anar forest, listening to the sounds of the woods and the low voices of the door moving about in the clearing below. Then abruptly, a shout went up from a cluster of dwarves at the foot of gardens, joined almost immediately by the shouts and cries of others mingled in with a huge clamour, swelling from the woods beyond the village of Coalhaven. The men on the stone bench rose uncertainly, looking quickly about for some sign of danger. Eleanor's strong hand came to rest on the pommel of his broadsword, strapped tightly at his side beneath the hunting cloak. A moment later one of the dwarfs below came rushing up the path, shouting wildly as he ran. They found him! They found him! He yelled excitedly, almost stumbling in his haste to reach them. Sheer and Flick exchanged startled look. 
The runner came to a breathless stop before the Mimbalano gripped his shoulder excitedly. Have they found Minion Lee? he demanded quickly. The dwarf nodded happily, his short, stocky frame heaving with the exertion of the dash to reach them with the good news. Without a word, Balanor bounded down the path toward their shouting. Sheer and Flick behind him. They reached the clearing below in a matter of seconds and ran along the main path through the woods leading to the village of Calhaven, several hundred yards beyond. Ahead of them, they could hear the excited shouting of the dwarf population, congratulating whomever it was who had found the lost islander. They reached the village and, pushing through the throngs of dwarfs blocking the way, made straight for the centre of all the excitement. A ring of guards parted to let them into a small courtyard formed by buildings on the right and left and a high stone wall in the rear. On a long wooden table lay the motionless body of Minion Lee his face pale and seemingly lifeless. A team of dwarf doctors bent dutifully over the inert form, apparently treating him for some injury. She gave a sharp cry and tried to rush forward, but Balinor's strong arm held him back as the warrior called out to one of the nearby dwarves. Pan, what's happened there? The solid-looking dwarf, dressed in armour apparently, one of the returning search party hastened to their side. He'll be all right, after he's treated. He was found entangled in one of the sirens out in the middle of the battle mound, lowlands, below the Silver River. Our search party didn't find him. It was Handel, returning from the city south of Benar. Balinor nodded and looked about for some sign of the rescuer. He left for the assembly hall to make his report. The dwarf responded to the unasked question. Motioning the two bellmen to follow him, Balinor made his way out of the courtyard to the crowd and across the main street to the large assembly hall. Inside were the offices of the governing officials of the village and the assembly room, in which they found the dwarf Hendel, sitting on one of the long benches, eating ravenously, while a scribe took down his report. Hendel looked up as they approached glanced curiously at the bellman and nodded briefly to Bellamore, continuing to devour his meal without interruption. Bellamore dismissed the scribe, and the three men sat down across from each other, who appeared both exhausted and starved. <sighs> what an idiot, tackling one of those sirens with a sword, he muttered. Got spunk, though. How is he? He'll be fine after he's treated, replied Balinor, grinning reassuringly at the uneasy bellman. How did you find him? Heard him yelling. The other continued to eat without pausing. I had to carry him almost seven miles before I ran into Pan and the search party along the Silver River. He paused and looked again at the two bellmen, who were listening intently. The dwarf appraised him curiously, looked back at Balinor, eyebrows raised. Friends of the Highlander, and of Balinor, responded the borderman, cocking his head meaningfully. Hendel merely nodded to them curtly. I'd never have known who he was if he hadn't mentioned your name. Hendel informed them shortly, indicating the tall borderman. It might help. Matters of now and then someone could tell me what was going on. Before it's happened, not after. He declined to comment further, and an amused Balinor smiled over to the puzzled brothers, shrugging slightly to indicate the dwarf was irresistible by nature. Sheer and Flick were a bit uncertain about the fellow's temperament, and had purposely kept silent while the other two conversed though both Bowman were eager to hear the full story behind Minion's rescue. What's your report on Stern and Wayford? Balinor asked finally, referring to the large Southland cities immediately south and west of the NR. Handel ceased eating and laughed abruptly. The officials of those two fine communities will consider the matter, 
you can send along a report. Typical bungling officials, elected by the disinterested people to juggle the ball until it can be passed on to some other fool. I could tell five minutes after I opened my mouth that they thought I was crazy. They don't see the danger until the sword is at their own throats. Then they scream for assistance from those who knew it all along. He paused and resumed his meal, obviously disgusted with the whole subject. I should have expected that, I suppose. Balanor sounded worried. How can we convince them of the danger? There hasn't been a war in so many years that no one wants to believe it could happen now. That's not the problem, as you well know, interjected the irate handle. They simply don't feel that they should be involved in the matter. After all, the frontiers are protected by dwarves, not to mention the cities of Calahorn and the Border Legion. We've been doing it up to now. Why can't we keep doing it more? Those poor fools. He trailed off slowly, finished with his statement and his meal, feeling tired from the long trip home. He had been on the road for almost three weeks, travelling to the cities of the Southland, and it all seemed to have been for nothing. He felt keenly discouraged. I don't understand what's happened, she announced quietly. Well, that's two of us, Hendel replied suddenly. I'm going to bed for about two weeks. See you then. He stood up abruptly and walked out of the assembly room without even a short farewell. His broad shoulders stooped wearily. The three men watched him go without speaking, the eyes fixed on his departing silhouette until it was lost from sight. Then she had turned questioningly to Balinor. It's the age-old tale of complacency, she had. The tall warrior sighed deeply and stretched as he rose. We may be standing on the brink of the greatest war in a thousand years, but no one wants to accept the fact. Everyone gets in the same room. Let a few take care of the gates to the city while the rest forget and go back to their home. It becomes a habit, depending on a few to protect the rest. And then one day, the few are not enough, and the enemy is within the city, right through the open gates. Is there really going to be a war? Flick asked almost fearfully. That is the question exactly, Balinor responded slowly. The only man who can give us that answer is absent and overdue. In the excitement of finding Minion alive and well, the Valman had temporarily forgotten Eleanor, the man who was the reason for their being in the NR in the first place. The by now familiar questions again flashed through their minds with new persistency. But the Valman had learned to live with them over the past few weeks, and all doubts were reluctantly shoved aside once more. Balinor caught their attention as he moved toward the open door, and they quickly followed. You mustn't mind Hendel, you know. He reassured them as they were. He's gruff like that with everyone. But he's one of the finest friends you could ask for. He has fought and outwitted the gnomes along the upper and half for years, protecting his people and the complacent citizens of the Southland, who so for quickly forget the crucial role of the dwarfs play at guardians of these borders. The gnomes would like to get their hands on him, I can tell you. Sheer and Flick said nothing, ashamed of the fact that their people, their own race, could be so selfish, yet realising that they too had been ignorant of the situation in the NR before hearing it from Bellamy. They were bothered by the thought of renewed hostilities between the races, recalling their history of lessons on the old race wars and the terrible hatred of those bitter years. The possibility of a third war of the races was chilling. Why don't you two go back to the gardens? Advised the Prince of Callahan. 
I'll have a message sent as soon as I hear of any change in Minion's condition. The brother reluctantly agreed, knowing that they had no other choice in the matter anyway. Before turning in that night, they stopped by the room where Minion was being kept, only to be told by the door sentry that their friend was asleep and should not be disturbed. But by the following afternoon, the Highlander was away and being visited by the ancient bailman. Even Flip was grudgingly relieved to see the other alive and well, though solemnly intoned that he had correctly predicted their misfortune many days in advance when they first decided to journey through the Black Oaks. Minion and Shea both laughed at Flick's eternal pessimism, but did not argue the point. She explained how Minion had been brought to Cowhaven by the Dwarf Handel and then went on to relate the mysterious way in which he and Flick had been found near the Silver River. Minion was as mystified as they over their strange journey and could offer no logical explanation. She had carefully refrained from mentioning the legend of the King of the Silver River, knowing full well what the Highlanders' response would be to any speculation that involved an old folk tale. That same day, in the early hours of the evening, word reached him that Alanon had returned. Sure and Flick were about to leave their rooms to visit Minion when they heard the excited shout of Dwarf rushing past their open windows toward the assembly hall where some sort of meeting was about to begin. The anxious bellmen had not taken two steps beyond their doorway when they were surrounded by a team of four Dwarf guards and hustled quickly through the pushing crowd past the open doors of the large assembly into a small adjoining room where they were told to remain. The dwarves closed the door and wordlessly as they exited slid the lock bolts into place and assumed positions immediately outside. The room was brightly lit and furnished with several long tables and benches at which the bewildered bellmen silently seated themselves. The windows of the room were closed and even without checking she knew that they would be barred like the door. From the assembly hall they could hear the deep voice of a single speaker. Several minutes later the door to the chamber opened and Minion, looking flushed but otherwise quite well, was briskly ushered in by two dwarf guards. When they were left alone, the Highlander explained that they had come for him the same as for the Valman. From snatches of conversation he had heard on the way over, it appeared that the dwarves in Colhaven, and probably all of the Anna, were preparing for war. Whatever news Alanon had brought back with him had thrown matters into a state of confusion in the dwarf community. He thought he had caught a quick glimpse of Balanor through the open doors of the assembly hall, standing on the platform at the front of the building, but the guards had rushed him past and he couldn't be sure. The voices from the congregation next door rose in a thunderous roar, and all three paused expectantly. Seconds passed as the shouting continued to roll through the large hall, spreading to the open grounds outside, where it was taken up by the dwarves there. At the deafening peak of the shouting, the door to their room suddenly burst open to admit the dark commanding figure of Alanon. He walked over to the Valmen quickly, shook their hands and congratulated them on their successful journey to Colhaven. He was dressed as he had been when Flick had first encountered him. His lean face half hidden in the long cow, his whole appearance dark and foreboding. He greeted Minion courteously, courteously and moved to the head of the nearest table, motioning the others to be seated. He had been followed into the room by Balinor and a number of dwarves who were apparently leaders in the community. Among them, there was a visible handle. Bringing up the rear of this position were two slim, almost shadowy figures in curious, loose-fitting woodsman garb, who quietly took seats near Alanon at the head of the table. She could see them clearly from his position at the other end, and concluded after quick observation that they were elves from the distant Westland. Their keen features, from the sharply raised eyebrows to the strange pointed ears, marked them distinctively. She had turned back and saw that both Flick and Minion were looking at, them, at him curiously, 
obviously appraising his own strong resemblance to the strangers. None of them had ever seen a whale, and while they knew that Sheer was half built and had heard descriptions given of the elven people, none had ever heard a chance to compare the Valmen to one. My voice. My friends, the deep voice of Eleanor boomed out in the slight stir of voices as he rose commandingly to his full height of seven feet. The room was instantly silent as all faces turned in his direction. My friends, I must now tell you what I have as yet told no one else. We have suffered a tragic loss. He paused and looked at the anxious faces in turn. Paranor has fallen. A division of gnome hunters under the command of the Warlock Lord has seized the sword of Shannara. There was dead silence for about two seconds before the dwarves were on their feet, shouting in anger. Balinor rose quickly in an effort to quiet them. Cheer and Flick looked at each other in disbelief. Only Minion seemed unsurprised by the announcement, his lean face carefully scrutinising the dark figure at the head of the table. Paranor was taken from within, Eleanor continued after some semblance of water had been restored. There is little question as to the fate of those who guarded the fortress and the sword. I am told that all were executed. No one knows exactly how it happened. Have you been there? She asked suddenly, feeling almost immediately that it was a stupid question. I left your home in the Vale so suddenly because I received word that an attempt would be made to secure Paranor. I arrived too late to help those within and barely escaped detection myself. That is one of the reasons I am so late in reaching Cull Haven. But if Paranor has fallen and the sword been taken, Flix whispered question trailed off ominously. Then what can we do now? Eleanor finished tasky. This is the problem facing us, the one we must provide an immediate answer for. The reason for this council. Elanon suddenly left his position at the head of the long table and moved around until he was standing directly behind Sheer. He placed one great hand on the slim shoulder and faced his attentive audience. The sword of Shannara is useless in the hands of the Warlock Lord. It can only be raised by a son of the house of Yul Shannara. This alone prevents the evil one from striking now. Instead, he has systematically hunted down and destroyed all members of that house, one at a time, one after another. Even those I tried to protect, all whom I could find, now they are all dead, all save one. And that one is young Shear. Shear is only half elf, but he is a direct descendant of the king who carried the great sword so many years before. Now he must raise it again. Shear would have bolted for the door if it had not been for the strong hand gripping his shoulder. He looked desperately at Flick and saw the fear in his own eyes mirrored in those of his brothers. Minion had not moved, but appeared visibly impressed by this grim declaration. What Elanon seemed to expect from Shear was more than any man had the right to ask. Well, I think we have shaken our young friend a bit, Elanon laughed shortly. Do not despair, Shear. Things are not as bad as they may seem to you right now. He turned abruptly, walked back to the head of the table, and faced the others. We must recover the sword 
at all costs. There is no other choice left to us. If we fail to do this, the whole of the land will be plunged into the greatest war the races have ever seen since the near destruction of life 2,000 years ago. The sword is the key. Without it, we must fall back on our mortal strength, our fighting prowess, a battle with iron and muscle that can only result in unaccountable thousands dying on both sides. The evil is in the Warlock Lord, and he cannot be destroyed without the aid of the sword and the courage of a few men, not the least of whom must be those of us in this room. Again he paused to measure the force of his words. There was absolute silence as he looked doubtfully at the silent gallery of grim faces staring back. Suddenly, Minlian Lee rose at the far end of the table and faced the giant speaker. What you are suggesting is that we go after the sword to Paranor. Eleanor nodded slowly, a half smile playing over his thin lips as he waited for a reaction from the startled listeners. His deep set eyes twinkled blackly beneath the great prow, watching him carefully the faces about him. Minion sat down slowly, total disbelief showing plainly on his handsome features as Eleanor continued. The sword is still at Paranor. There is an excellent possibility that it will remain there. Neither Bronar nor the bearers of the skull can personally remove the talisman. His mere physical presence is an anathema to their continued existence in the mortal world. Any form of exposure for more than several minutes would cause excruciating pain. This means that any attempt to transport the sword north to the Skull Kingdom must be accomplished by the use of the gnomes that hold Baranor. Eventine and his elven warriors were given the task of securing the Druid stronghold and the sword. While Baranor has been lost to us, the elves still hold the southern stretch of the Strelheim north of the fortress, and any attempt to travel north to the Dark Lord would require breaking through their patrol. Apparently Eventime was not a paranormal when it was taken, and I have no reason to believe that he will not endeavour to regain the sword, or, at the very least, thought any attempt to remove it. The Warlock Lord will be aware of this, and I do not think he will risk losing the weapon by having the gnomes carry it out. Instead, he will entrench at Paranor, until his army moves south. There is a possibility that the Warlock Lord does not expect us to attempt to regain the sword. He may believe that the House of Shannara has been exterminated. He may expect us to concentrate on strengthening our defences against his forthcoming assault. If we act immediately, a small party may be able to slip into the keep, undetected, and retrieve the sword. Such an undertaking would be dangerous. But if there is even the remotest chance of success, the risk is worth it. Eleanor had risen and indicated he wished to speak to those assembled. Eleanor nodded and sat down. I do not understand the power of the sword over the Warlock Lord. That much I freely admit, the Thor warrior began. But I do know the threat that we all face if Bronar's army invades the Southland in the Anar, as our reports indicate, it is preparing to do. My homeland would be the first to face this threat, and if I can prevent it in any way, then I cannot do otherwise. I will go with Alanon. The dwarfs leaped up again at this point, enthusiastic shoutedly, their support. Alanon stood up and raised his long arm in a plea for silence. These two young elves at my side are cousins of Aventine. They will accompany me 
for their sake in this matter is at least as great as your own. Palano will go as well, and I will take one of the dwarf chieftains no more. This must be a small, highly skilled party of hunters if we are to succeed. Pick the best man among you and let him come with us. He looked at the end of the table where Sheer and Flick sat watching in a mixed state of shock and confusion. Minion Lee pondered quietly, looking at no one in particular. Elanon glanced expectantly at Sheer, his grim face suddenly softening as he saw the frightened eyes of the young Valman who had come so far through so many dangers to this apparent haven of safety, only to be told that he was expected to leave it for an even more perilous trip northward. But there had been no time to break the news to the Valm in a gentle way. He shook his head doubtfully and waited. Uh, I think I had better go. The abrupt declaration came from Minion, who had again risen to his feet to face the others. I came with Shear this far to be certain he reached the safety of Cull Heaven, which he has done. My duty to him is finished, but I owe it to my homeland and to my people to protect them in any way I can. What can you offer then? asked Elanon abruptly. Astonished that the Highlander would volunteer without first speaking to his friends, Shear and Flick were clearly dumbfounded by this unexpected announcement. I'm the best bowman in the Southland, Minion answered smoothly. Probably the best tracker as well. Elanon seemed to hesitate for a moment, then looked at Bellinor, who quietly shrugged. For a brief moment, Minion and Elanon locked gazes as if to judge each other's intentions. Minion smiled coldly at the grim historian. Why should I answer to you? he queried shortly. The dark figure at the other end of the table stared at him almost curiously, and a deathly silence settled over the company. Even Balanor stepped back one short pace in shock. She knew instantly that Minion was asking for trouble, and that everyone at the table except the three companions knew something about the foreboding Elanon that, that they did not. The frightened Valman shot a quick look at Flick, whose flushed face had gone pale at the thought of a confrontation between the two men. Desperate to avoid any trouble, she stood up suddenly and cleared his throat. Everyone looked in his direction, and his mind went blank. You have something to say? demanded Elanon blackly. She nodded and his mind raced deep, desperately. Knowing what was expected, he looked again to Flick, who managed a barely perceptible nod, indicating that he would go along with whatever his brother decided. She cleared his throat a second time. My special guilt appears to be that I was born in the wrong family, but I had better see this matter through. Flick and I, Minion too, will go to Paranor. Elanor nodded his approval, and even managed a slight smile. Inwardly pleased with the young Valman, Cher, more than any of the others, had to be strong. He was the last son of the House of Shannara, and the fate of so many would depend on that single small chance of birth. At the other end of the table, Minion Lee relaxed quietly in his seat, a barely audible sigh of release escaping his lips as he silently congratulated himself. He had deliberately provoked Elanon, and in so doing had forced Shear to come to his rescue by agreeing to go to, to, go to Paranor. It had been a desperate gamble to induce the little Valman to make up his mind that he was going with him. The Highlander had come close to what might have been a fatal confrontation with Elanon. He had been lucky. He wondered if luck would smile on all of them during the journey ahead.